Hello and welcome back. We're continuing our read through of the Bible Jesus read by Philip Yancey. Hopefully you're really enjoying it. Remember, you can always uh, buy it for yourself and read along or uh, if you're really enjoying it, I always put a link in our uh, description. So if you want to click on that and purchase your own copy, you're more than welcome to. Um, otherwise, let's continue reading out of the chapter on Deuteronomy, A Taste of Bittersweet. Somehow, just talking about the bitterness softens it a little. There have surely been good times, Moses reminds himself. He's had God by his side each step of the way, and even when it feels as if God alone supports him, that's enough. The time when Korah and the gang rebelled against him in the old days, he would have grabbed a sword and run it through them. Instead, he simply waited for God to settle it. Later, when his own siblings turned against him and mocked his African wife, then too he stood aside and let God work out the justice. And God did, giving Aaron and Miriam the dressing down of their lives. With him I speak face to face, God said of Moses in a voice like thunder. How dare you speak against my servant? Moses had hung his head and blushed. Once Moses overheard someone talking about the meekest man on the face of the earth, and to his astonishment he learned they were talking about him. His mother and Pharaoh would certainly never have used that description. Moses had chuckled to himself, probably not God either. Meek, humble, imagine. Over the years, Moses had learned something so sweet and strange and mysterious that only one word can begin to capture it. Grace. God's free, undeserved gift. He has learned that God loves him despite his failures. With a pure, stubborn, everlasting love. After more than a century of life, Moses has given up trying to figure out what God sees in him. Or sees in the rest of the Hebrews, for that matter. He just accepts it and gives thanks. Moses takes a long drought of water from a goatskin bag, moistens his lips, clears the phlegm from his throat. <clears throat> Listen up, pay attention. Here's what I want you to remember, even if you forget everything else I say. Uh, think on this. Another pause, another swallow. The crowd still detecting a change in Moses' voice. An expression of bliss crosses his face so that it almost glows. They know that expression. They've seen it whenever Moses emerged from the sacred tent after he meets with God. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were numerous, more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with his mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant for, of love to a thousand generations to those who love him and keep his command. He's warming to the message now his weary voice ascending in both pitch and volume. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord sets his affection on your forefathers and loved them, and he chooses you, their descendants, above all nations, as it is today. He is your praise. He is your God who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. Your forefathers who went down into Egypt were 70 in all. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. As the stars in the sky. He likes that. Didn't God promise as much to Abraham? Now here it is. Prophecy fulfilled before his very eyes. They may have murmured and rebelled and driven the old generation to an early grave. But here they stand, the Israelites, God's chosen people, his per peculiar treasures, assembled at the very border of a new land. He drinks again from the goatskin bag, letting the words sink in. They are responding to the positive tone. Who doesn't want to hear that God loves them? The first time Moses encountered God close up, it took his breath away. He hid his face in shame and fear. 
Yet after 40 years of such encounters, he and God have grown to be, could he say it, friends? He argues with God, even bargains with him, and he loses sometimes, as with his request to enter the promised land, but sometimes he wins, like the time God nearly called off the whole project until Moses talked him out of it. Moses ignores his notes and begins to ramble, reminding the crowd of that his finest hour. Three days' journey from Egypt, and they were complaining about the water. A month later, they had forgotten the bullwhips and were mewling about Egypt's figs and pomegranates. And then a month after that, the holiest moment in Moses' life, he descended from the cloud to find a scene that made him wretch. He had been meeting with God on the sacred mountain, getting the stone tablets inscribed by God's own hand. When he came down, his face shining like a lantern, he found them cavorting around a golden calf, an Egyptian idol. It was too much. He would have divorced his people on the spot had not God reached that decision first. Suddenly, Moses was the only thing preventing the annihilation of every last Hebrew. God meant business. Moses threw the sacred tablets to the ground, shattering them, then threw himself down. He lay there prostrate for 40 days and 40 nights, a day's penance for every day he spent with God on the holy mountain. He ate no bread, drank no water, and all day long the Hebrews warily circled his still living body, wondering if he had died, wondering if they would now die. They certainly would have had Moses not pleaded their case before God. Leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. A tempting offer God made him, but Moses would not leave God alone. He argued, pleaded, whined. He appealed to God's mercy, to his pride, to his reputation. He begged God to take him, Moses, instead of and let the others live. He reminded God of his favorites, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At last, God relented. He allowed Moses to see a visible glimpse of, him, glimpse of him, such that no one on earth had ever seen. He made a new covenant, agreeing to accompany his people to the promised land. Though reared among the Egyptians and their animal-shaped gods, Moses rediscovered a fundamental fact about God forgotten during the 400 years of silence. God is a person. During the years of science, silence, the Hebrews thought of God, if at all, as a distant, unapproachable, ineffable mystery who showed little concern over what was transpiring on earth. Moses reminded the Hebrews that God is as personal as they themselves. Indeed, their own personhood was a faint reflection of what God is like. When God makes a list of commandments, love takes first place the basis of his whole relationship with humanity. God meets in a tent and discusses policy as a man speaks to a friend. He listens and he argues back. God also feels pain. When jilted, God suffers like any wounded lover. He makes threats, then backs down from them. He negotiates and signs contracts. This last fact, above all, separated the Hebrews from their neighbors. Even the haughty Egyptian lived in fear of their capricious gods. The Canaanites sacrificed children to appease their unpredictable gods, but the God of the Hebrews proved willing to sign a contract detailing exactly what he expected from his people and what he promised in return. Except for Orthodox Jews, not many people today devote time to the legal code recorded in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. The laws seem repetitious and generally irrelevant to modern society. Yet, as Deuteronomy shows most clearly, these laws simply set the boundaries of a vastly unequal relationship between an awesome holy God and an ordinary people prone to failure and rebellion. Years later, Moses knew some would question specific laws in the contract. Moses anticipated such a question. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and the laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell them. We, are slaves of, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible. 
upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land that he promised on oath to our forefathers. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. In short, God gave the laws to the Hebrews for their own good. Their prosperity, their very survival depended on this contract. Moses spelled out God's end of the bargain in vivid detail. Israelites, Israelite wives would have many babies. All their crops would produce bountifully. Cattle and sheep would multiply. He even ex included this extraordinary promise. The Lord will keep your free, to, free form you, oh my goodness, sorry about that. The Lord will keep you free from every disease. For the Israelites to receive these benefits, God asked only one thing in return, a big thing. As it turned out, follow the covenant agreement set forth in the contract. God had an unprecedented relationship with the band of refugees who roamed the Sinai for 40 years. Moses, for one, could not seem to get over it. Ask from one end of the heavens to the other. Has anything so great ever ever happened? Or has anything like it ever been heard of? Has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation like the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? Later, the nation would go through Job-like times that called the contract itself into doubt. Their faith would confront questions of unfairness and feelings of abandonment. Now, however, at this moment, the wondrous plan was being fulfilled. God, the sovereign chooser, the steadfast promise maker, was bringing his chosen people into the promised land. And that's where we leave today. Leave a comment, leave a like, and uh, we'll see you again next week.